The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. What happens when you have a potential Son of Sam cult member? a possible drug-dealing photographer with videotaped evidence of a murder, and a Smith College junior who was clearly in the wrong place at the wrong time. An unsolved Halloween crime that has baffled investigators for the last 40 years. What better way to end our month of the macabre than with a crime that will have its 40th anniversary in just a few days? And this crime has it all. Mystery, intrigue, a possible connection to an already imprisoned serial killer, and the best holiday of them all. Today's margarita is in honor of the place we're spending today's episode, the Big Apple. But because we're in the fall, cozy, spooky season, we're doing a riff on that fruit by making it an apple cider margarita. So for today's margarita, we're going to take two parts tequila and combine that with two parts apple cider. We'll add one part lime juice because remember, to have a margarita, in my opinion, you need tequila and lime juice. Then we'll add one part triple sec and one part simple syrup, a very sweet drink today. We're going to take all of our parts and put them in a shaker with ice. We'll shake her up in order to both chill it and mix it. We strain over fresh ice because we're bougie, 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 and in a black salt-rimmed glass because, come on people, it's Halloween, we know this. Now, we shall get to the terrifying Big Apple cider crime. I know I said this once, but I'm about to say it twice. Today's crime remains unsolved. Not my fave. I much prefer to tie it all up with a pretty bow and figure out what justice looks like for victims, and also to dive into the brains of the perpetrator. If I'm being honest with myself, Figuring out the pathology behind why terrible crimes happen is actually my favorite part. But there are some theories as to what happened in this case, and I'll definitely do a bit of a dive into at least the weirdest one, because, man, it's a weird one. Also, to be totally transparent, there's not a ton of information out there about this case. Most of the news articles are basically just reprints of the same AP articles, and at least in the news... They haven't really revisited this case at all in the last 40 years. It's just cold. Elizabeth Platzman was born on August 4th, 1961, in Manhasset, New York, which is a hamlet on Long Island. Her parents, Rita Jane Hansen Platzman and Paul Platzman, were relatively wealthy. Her father had actually started his career as a production man in wholesale ladies' garments, making the equivalent of about $85,000 in today's money as an 18-year-old. So by the time his daughters were born, when he was in his late 30s, it's fair to say he was making an even more impressive income as an inventor. Rita was a librarian at the Port Washington Library. Elizabeth and her older sister by five years, Patricia, grew up in beautiful Roslyn Park in a pre-Civil War home overlooking the Roslyn Duck Pond. The wooden frame house on Main Street was a designated historic landmark even at the time of her youth. Elizabeth attended an exclusive private Quaker school, Friends Academy, where she was in theater and art and excelled in school. She was described by her neighbors, friends, and teachers as gentle, sweet, sensitive, and kind. Elizabeth was known to frequent New York City, even in high school, to visit art shows and museums. In 1979, Liz, as her friends knew her, graduated from Friends Academy and enrolled that fall at the prestigious women's university, Smith College, a school of about 2,600 students, where she decided to study art history. She was described as a talented amateur photographer, and she quickly achieved honors student status. She liked to photograph flowers. Her college friends called her honest and remembered her as being concerned about good eating habits and staying healthy. She was lined up to be the next editor-in-chief of the campus literary magazine, New Current, and she worked as a photographer and guide at the Smith College Museum of Art. She was hoping to get an internship at a museum or an art gallery in New York City. 
Ronald Lynn Sisman was born on February 19, 1942, somewhere, I think, in Winnipeg, Canada. Honestly, despite doing a lot more research than I even normally do about these cases, I really couldn't find anything about his upbringing or his family. Fairly certain that he was Jewish, but beyond that, there's not really anything there. I'm not sure if it's because he's from Canada or if it's because of how he ended up being portrayed in the media after what comes next, but his background is really kind of a mystery. Ron was a photographer and somehow made his way to New York City. We know that he was living in an apartment near Greenwich Village, for sure by May of 1980, but I think it's safe to say that he probably had been living in this city for longer than that, as it seems he was an established photographer and was running two photography businesses, Postergraphs Inc. and Universal Poster Inc., out of his apartment in a four-story graystone building in New York City. He wasn't, however, an official resident of the city. His driver's license listed his residence as just off the south fork of the New River southwest of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Seems like Ron was a bit of a wayward traveler, a wandering spirit perhaps, the artistic type. The New York City apartment building superintendent described Ron as, quote, a secretive person who stayed up late at night and there was a lot of traffic in and out of his apartment all night, end quote. Take that with however many grains of salt and sips of margarita you choose and draw your own conclusions with that. And something about Ron had attracted Elizabeth. In the summer of 1981, just before Elizabeth's junior year at Smith, she and Ron had met through Elizabeth's cousin, Hilary Sklar, who lived next door to Ron. Her cousin's husband, Stuart, was a partner in Ron's photography studios. A lot of news reports report Elizabeth and Ron as dating or as in some kind of relationship, but there's not a lot of evidence of that. Her friends at college didn't know anything of an older boyfriend living in the city, and it seems like they really only had the common interest of photography, which in my opinion is enough to form a friendship, but maybe not much more. Elizabeth had visited Ron several times since September, but remember Elizabeth was looking for connections in the art world of New York City. It makes sense that she may be doing this and not actually wanting to secretly date a man 29 years her senior, but who knows, and honestly, who cares? It doesn't really matter. Ron had a bit of a strange moment in the previous year that is definitely worth mentioning. Oh, and uh, go ahead and start drinking. Drinking warning, beep, 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 drink. Ron had been friendly with millionaire producer 37-year-old Roy Radin, and had been running around in the same social circle as both Roy and 24-year-old Melanie Haller. Ron had even at one point photographed the Welcome Back Cotter actress, and they may have been dating. In April of 1980, Melanie had alleged that Roy had drugged her at gunpoint, and then assaulted and raped her at a party in his mansion. Roy was never charged with rape, but fined $1,000 and charged with illegal possession of a pistol. The following month, in May of 1980, Ron himself hit the news when Melanie told doctors at Mount Sinai Hospital that Ron had forced her to take drugs when she was at his apartment. Ron at the time claimed that he had only tried to calm her down by offering her her own prescribed sedative that she had in her own purse. She had begun to get incredibly upset when she had begun recalling what had happened at the mansion with Roy Radin. The charges against Ron were eventually dropped because Melanie chose not to cooperate with the authorities. It turns out that Melanie, according to her mom, had what she classified as a nervous breakdown, which I'd like to add is totally understandable after what had happened to her, but she was also having delusions of people trying to hurt her. Terrible. In the afternoon of Thursday, October 29, 1981, Elizabeth got a ride, the three hours, from Northampton, Massachusetts to New York City. She probably arranged the ride by posting a notice to the college's ride board, where students could arrange for transportation off campus. Elizabeth told her friends that she planned to stay with a relative in the city on Thursday night, and then was headed to Long Island to spend the weekend with her family. It's possible that relative she meant that she was going to stay with on Thursday night was her cousin. Remember, that was Ron's neighbor. And maybe she arrived at her cousin's house and she wasn't there, and so she decided to stay with Ron instead. 
She also had a photography assignment to shoot a photographic essay for a new student magazine to be published by the Seven Sisters Colleges, and she didn't have all the needed photography equipment for the assignment. It was also speculated that she went to Ron's house to borrow the things that she needed. No one really knows for sure. What is known is that by Saturday, her family, having been expecting Elizabeth on Friday, became worried and reached out to the dormitory at Smith University. There were only horrors to come. All right, friends, take a swig of your delicious big apple cider margarita, all right? Maybe two. At 7.40 p.m. on Saturday, October 31st, neighbors entered the unlocked third and fourth apartment of Ron Sisman and came upon the site of a rampage. The entire apartment had been ransacked. All of the furniture had been torn apart, and it looked like whoever entered the building was on the hunt for something. You couldn't walk through the apartment without stepping on something. That was the amount of sheer disarray in the apartment. And blood was splattered on walls throughout the entire apartment. The superintendent of the building, Gerald Warfield, said, quote, I thought they had been bludgeoned to death, end quote. Ron and Elizabeth, whose faces were covered with bruises, had been brutally beaten and then shot in the back of their heads, execution style. It was reported that Elizabeth was shot three times and Ron four. All identification had been removed from the bodies. It's unknown what all, if anything, was taken, although a 25 caliber handgun that was registered to Ron appeared to be missing. It's possible that handgun may have even been the murder weapon. One of the reasons that it took so long for neighbors to notice anything awry was both that no one had heard any shots fired, which may have meant that the murderers used a silencer, and there were no signs of a forced entry. Detectives believed that two men had entered the apartment, and they theorized that Ron may have known his killers and initial beliefs of a motive were that the crime was drug-related. You see, a small amount, around two ounces, of cocaine was found in the apartment, which, as you can imagine, is just about the least surprising element of this case, and it's possible that Ron was a small-time cocaine dealer, evidently generally just to friends. It was theorized that it may have been a drug deal gone wrong or something similar. Another theory was that the crime was a robbery gone wrong. Interestingly, Ron had recently applied for two additional gun permits because someone had broken into his apartment before, and he evidently feared for his safety. A detective investigating the case said, quote, The killers may have been looking for something specific, and if they were, they sure didn't know where to look because the place was turned upside down. End quote. Detectives believe strongly that Elizabeth was tragically, simply, in the wrong place at the wrong time. There weren't a lot of early leads. The case went cold. The end. Thanks for listening. Just kidding. Things in typical month of the macabre, margs and mayhem fashion are about to take a turn to the bazaar. Shortly after the murder, one lead did come into the local police station. The police received a phone call from a jailhouse informant. Evidently, the crime had already been predicted two weeks before it happened by a fellow inmate of the informant. The man bragged that a murder would be committed in Greenwich Village on Halloween by his fellow cult members. The cult members would perform this ritual murder by shooting two people in the head before ransacking their apartment to remove incriminating evidence. Get the necessary Halloween bloodletting and get rid of a snuff film. Two birds with one stone, I suppose. Naturally, the police took this lead seriously and investigated it further, but what they were getting themselves into was beyond weird. Who was this fellow inmate who had predicted the heinous crime? None other than Son of Sam, David Berkowitz himself. Now, David Berkowitz had been arrested in 1976, five years prior, due to his own murder spree during that summer, a series of crimes which took the lives of six victims and left seven others wounded and terrorized the entire city. He had been convicted and sentenced to concurrent life sentences in 1977. But police had always suspected that David may have had help during that summer, and they also believed that he had been involved heavily in a satanic cult. So police questioned him and were shocked when he was able to accurately describe specific details about the apartment, including how it looked, right down to an unusual, ornate chandelier that was in the apartment. 
He was able to describe details of the crime that it was likely would be impossible for him to know without knowing the killers. And according to David, he could even name the motive for why the crime happened. Evidently, the murder of Stacy Moskowitz, son of Sam's last victim, was captured on film. And the person who captured that footage? A local photographer, Ron Sisman. Ron was the one recording the murder from a distance. The snuff footage was really important to Ron as he planned to use it as leverage to get out of his own drug charges. And this film was incriminating as it would show that David was not the sole perpetrator of the murder and that would shed light onto the existence of a satanic cult. So according to David, the cult had to take care of Ron to prevent this footage from getting out. So, two cult members went to the apartment killed Elizabeth and Ron, and trashed the whole place looking for the recording. Interestingly, there is some evidence that is similar between this crime and other Son of Sam murders in that Elizabeth and Ron had their licenses stolen. This was something that occurred in other crimes. Personal identifying objects were always taken. But at the time, there was no concrete proof no solid evidence that backed up David's claims. And as a result, to this day, no one has been arrested for the murders. The murders of Ronald Sisman and Elizabeth Platzman remain unsolved to this day. So, what do you think? Who do you think may have been responsible for the deaths of Elizabeth Platzman and Ronald Sisman? Do you think it was drug-related or a burglary gone wrong? Or is it possible that Son of Sam himself has some connection to the case? And why do you think crimes go unsolved? Honestly, how can someone keep the fact that they've murdered someone a secret to their own grave? How could they possibly kill someone and never tell anyone? I'll just say, as someone who's never had a secret she could keep for more than, like, a month, at the most, this just seems impossible to me. And if they did tell someone, how could that person keep it a secret? Unsolved crimes, especially in the modern era like this one, are pretty much a mystery to me. Elizabeth Platzman was laid to rest at the Manhasset Friends Meeting House Cemetery in Manhasset, New York. She's buried in the same Quaker cemetery as her mother, who died nearly 15 years after her daughter in 1995. Ronald Lynn Sisman was laid to rest at the Rosh Pina Memorial Park in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. His headstone is inscribed, Aaron Lieb, son of Beryl Zellman. The murders remain unsolved. Interestingly, Roy Radin, the producer accused of attacking actress Melanie Haller, was himself murdered in California on May 13, 1983, leaving more connections about the potential drug and similar potential cult connection. There is evidence that shows that it's possible he was killed by the same cult. That crime also remains unsolved. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, remains imprisoned in the upstate New York Supermax prison, Attica Correctional Facility. As mandated by state law, he is up for parole every two years. COVID delayed his May of 2020 hearing until further notice. Interestingly, David was interviewed by Maury Povich in 1997. In the interview, David vaguely mentioned something similar to what he said in 1981. Maury asked David whether Ron was the one recording the murder, and he said that Ron did want to do some filming that evening. Let me know in the comments or on social media if you want me to do a full episode on the ridiculous mayhem that is Son of Sam. Let's just say it involves a dog possessed by the devil. Drink up, people. Drink up. Thanks for hanging out with me. Our very first month of the macabre has come to a close, and I've learned a lot and hope to do a lot better job next year with my planning so that I can produce more spooky Halloween fun. Next week, we're doing another short featuring some animal mayhem, and in honor of that, we're having a nut-based margarita. Pecans. So we will need to do a little prep work. We're going to infuse, again, not an expensive tequila with pecans and maple syrup. Make sure to do that a few days before you want to make the drink to let the flavors, well, infuse. And let's keep an open mind. The maple margarita from earlier this year was delicious. Make sure you've joined at least one of our social media sites. Don't forget, we've got that giveaway coming up in just a few months. And make sure to leave a review or rating wherever you've joined the mayhem. 
all the links are in the bio. I'll see you next week for some squirrel madness and the return of the mini mayhem. At least for this episode, it's too good not to share. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to murdering strangers on Halloween night. Happy Halloween, everybody.